Well, good morning, everybody. Now, the, now the sermon title is Isaiah 53, Portrait of the Lamb, Portrait of the Lamb, from the cross to the throne. Now, there's a lot of messianic prophecy in scripture. I was with a Jewish believer just yesterday in Philadelphia, and 19 years ago, Calvary Chapel of, of Philadelphia, where I used to attend, they called me up. I went to church there, and they said, there's a Jewish, unsaved Jewish man here, and he really wants to know more about uh, Christianity. Well, that's tremendous, because I've gone to a lot of Jewish people, and I've gotten threatened many times. They got spit on, because I was in Jewish ministry for 30 years, and it's, it's a privilege. Even though he gets spit on, it's, it's a privilege to, to witness for him. But to have, to have a Jewish, unsaved Jewish person want me to tell them about Christianity... How perfect is that? So again, 19 years ago, so he came to my office. We used to live across the street from Calvary Philly, like 100 yards from the church. So he came over, and you know one of the passages we focused on? Isaiah 53. What, that was one of them. And the Lord used me in spite of the dumb things I say and do. I think we, you can all maybe can... Uh, maybe you can agree with me on that, and I'm sure you have maybe similar. But he used me in spite of myself, but especially it's not me that does anything special, but it's the power of his word and the power of Isaiah 53, and this person became a believer. And many, many countless numbers of Jewish people have become believers through Isaiah 53, and a lot of people call that the gospel of the Old Testament. So we're going to talk about that today, and I guess I can... Turn this on. Can you do me a favor? Yeah. Slide over to that light oh, of course, of course. Right that better? Perfect. Thank you. <laughs> it, I think it helps to turn it on, right? Let's see. Yeah. Where is the on button? There it is. Oh. Try this again. Oh. Sorry about that. No I'm turning it on. Working? I might have you control back there, maybe, unless you can. I saw the light go on, but it's. Turn it off and then turn it back on and then give it a second. Let's try. Now to have you guys. Uh, thank you. Apologize for that. Until then, can you, uh, do you mind turning the, this slide? There it is. So wouldn't you like to take, uh, thanks for your patience, wouldn't you like to take a crash course with Yeshua? Yeshua would be, is his Jewish name. They didn't call him Jesus in the first century. Oh, so the, the top and bottom one? Yep. Thank you. So they called him Yeshua. Wouldn't you love to take a crash course with Jesus on Messianic prophecy? So in Luke 24, remember what happened? The two men walking to Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and they're just talking. Jesus appears. and says, what are you guys intently talking about? And with sadness on their faces, one of those named Cleopas, he said, basically, where have you been? Like, <laughs> you don't know what, what, what happened? So then he gave them, basically, he doesn't say crash course, but he explained about himself through the entire uh, Tanakh. And Tanakh is the Hebrew word for, for the Old Testament. Wouldn't that have been incredible to know which passages did he go to and what did he say? Well, one of them would have been Isaiah 53, I think, no doubt. So on that day in the first century, we had uh, a lot of people had uh, expectations. Expectations dash because the Hebrew Bible really paints two pictures of Messiah, one being a suffering lamb and the other being this, this, this lion, this powerful lion that comes back. But when you're under dominion to Rome, guess which one you're going to focus more on? Is it the suffering servant, the suffering lamb, or this powerful lion that can overthrow? You, you can guess which one. So they kind of pushed away the suffering lamb, and they focused on that. So they had a lot of expectations. Jesus didn't meet those expectations. They didn't truly understand that he would rise from the dead. And also, another thing is that they thought that Jesus can't be the Messiah because he didn't bring worldwide peace. When would he do that? Yeah, when he comes back. So we know there's two comings. There's the, the rapture. That's a fancy word for Jesus, the groom, we're the bride, snatching us away forcibly. Are you looking forward to that? Yes. I wouldn't mind if my sermon got cut, 
short. Would you mind that? We're with, with Jesus, so our groom is going to come back to get the bride and take us back to heaven with them. And when you get depressed and get down, you're not feeling well, please, please focus on things above, not on things below. So he will, the rapture's first, then the tribulation. This is not generic problems we go through. This is the seven-year tribulation. And then Jesus will come back in a horse, believers following him. I, I've already named my horse that we're going to be fall back on, following Jesus. And then he brings peace after appeared, and he'll reign then in Jerusalem for a thousand years. Amen? Look, looking forward to that? So let's read Luke 24, 25 to 27. So then he said to them, O foolish ones and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not the Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And then beginning at Moses... That would be the first five books of the Old Testament, the, the, the Hebrew Scriptures, and all the prophets, probably including the Psalms too, he expounded to them in all the Scriptures. See that? In all the Scriptures, the things concerning himself. That wasn't recorded. It'd be amazing to hear it. So how many Scriptures did he go to? How long did he take? Was he walking really slow so he could cover all those passages? Someday we'll find out. Now, if you look at 1 Peter, it's another interesting passage where Peter says of this salvation. Now, Peter is the, talking to writing believers who are going through a lot of suffering, and they need encouragement. And he talks about that suffering, uh, the good, the positive things that come from suffering in chapter 1 before these uh, verses 10 and 11. So he says of this salvation, the prophets have inquired and searched carefully who prophesied of the grace that would come to you, searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ who was in them was indicating when he testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glories that would follow. Do you notice the two things there? The sufferings of Christ and the glories that would follow. So the sufferings come first, and as encouragement to all of us, and we'll, we'll say this throughout the, this message, suffering is first. Keep your focus on things above. Jesus is coming back. There's a crown. Yeah. Glenn, I wish you'd be a little more excited. <laughs> Love you, Glenn. Glenn was in some of my classes. You know, miss you, and we had a great time at Calvary Chapel, Old Bridge, and some classes there, so I'm, uh, I miss hearing that. So he's coming back. So keep your focus on that. But the sufferings are first, and the glories will follow. Hebrews 12. You know the Hebrews 12, the, the witnesses surrounding him. And what did Christ keep his focus on with the terrible suffering he went through for all of us? He kept his focus on what was awaiting him, and that should be the same for all of us. So the readers would have been highly encouraged, the readers that read this First Peter, to remember they would experience glory after they're suffering, and they were waiting for uh, that return. So the sufferings and the glories that follow, the lamb, then the lion. Again, there's two comings, the second, the first coming, second coming. The second coming has two phases to it. We talked about that. So the rapture, some, some churches make, you know, combine them into one coming. Huge mistake. I'm on Bridge Bible Talk. We, we have a lot of people calling with, with questions. You never know what you're going to get. Uh, but we have uh, some people asking us questions about that. We talk about there's at least 14 differences between the rapture and the second coming, two totally different events. So suffering first, so the suffering lamb who would be silent, and then a different picture than this, uh, this powerful lion that will come back someday, and we're going to be following him. Now, some people say, well, these prophecies, I don't know if I should believe these prophecies. Well, the science of probability and prophecy is very interesting. Do you realize that the chance of one man fulfilling just eight prophecies is one in 10 to the 17th power? Now, that's not, not a number that we, we use uh, very often. That's 100 quadrillion. Do you say quadrillion very often? Have you ever said that word before, ever? 100 quadrillion or 100,000 million million. So Peter Stoner, who is professor emeritus of science at Westmont College, claims that that many silver dollars would be enough to cover the face of the entire 
state of Texas two feet deep. By the way, as a side comment, and I didn't think about this in the shower, but uh, I guess I could have. Uh, how in the world does someone figure that out? That that's not a typical math. If you get that question for a math class, that would be really something that's giving me a headache, so I'm going to move on. Now, I've been to Texas. I've driven for days to get across Texas. Texas is huge. So who in his right mind would even suppose that a blindfolded man heading out of Dallas by foot or car, whatever, in any direction, would be able on his very first attempt to pick up one marked beforehand? Get the picture? You put that many silver dollars covering the state of Texas two feet deep. You mark one of them. And then you walk around and try to find that one out of all this 100, you know, this huge number. And this, th these estimates were worked out by 12 different classes representing 600 university students. And they weighed, the students weighed all the factors. They discussed each prophecy at length. And they examined the different circumstances uh, that might indicate that men had conspired together to fulfill a certain prophecy. And then they made their estimates very conservative. And then Professor Stoner took their estimates and even made it even more conservative. It encouraged skeptics and scientists to make their estimates. So this is a number that came from that. Wow, isn't that credible? Now remember, that's only eight prophecies. Eight prophecies. What, what about if he had, now this kind of blows your mind, where 48 prophecies. And people say, well, this just so happened. Seriously? You're serious now. This just so happened. That number is mind-blowing. I mean, I can't even imagine that number. This is 157 zeros. Glenn, do you want to count those, bro, to see? I made a mistake. That's your assignment. Count all those. So there's a lot of prophecies we could, we could focus on. In fact, in class, we go through a lot of the key prophecies, and it's a lot of fun. But we're going to zoom in on Isaiah 52, 13. Now, chapter breaks are very unfortunate. There's a lot of chapter breaks. I'm sure Pastor Dave has talked about when he's going verse by verse that are extremely unfortunate. This is, this is very unfortunate. But the chapter break, I think, should have been before, you know, 52.13 should have been the first, the first verse of the chapter, not 53.1. But it is what it is. But it starts at 52.13. And this is the reaction of the nation. So we're going to first talk about 52.13 to 15, Port to the Messiah. So I'm going to go forward one. Yeah, so the reaction of the nations. So this is talking about, uh, we're going to go and do verse 13 first. So the servant can be Israel. Now we have this, my servant. See the my is capitalized? So this is now God speaking. 52, Isaiah 53 starts at 52, 13. It's like a song, has five stanzas. Stanza one, so three verses each, 15 verses total. Stanza one is God speaking. God is speaking, and then God speaks at the end. In the middle, it's the people speaking. So this is God speaking first. So he said, my servant. Now, when I talk to Jewish people, they say, well, that servant can be Israel. Well, it can be. But if you read Isaiah, you see it's used 12 times, uh, at least more than that. And if you look at the context, how do you know if that servant is talking about the Messiah, Jesus, or talking about Israel, which was flawed, because of context. Context. If you read the context, it talks about Israel being sinful. Can that be the Messiah? I mean, we're all, I'm, I'm a sinner. You're all sinners. Don't take that the wrong way. But uh, Messiah, Jesus, is not a sinner. So in the context, if it talks about, if it says Israel, then that's pretty, that's pretty straightforward, right? So in the context, we know that here, this has to be, Messiah Jesus. It's very, very clear. And for a Christian reading through these verses, it's almost like you're taking a trip down the Via Della Rosa. So the summary of 52.13 is the servant would be successful. I mean, these three verses, 13 to 15, the first stanza, the summary of this, the servant would be success, successful in his mission, but first he would be disfigured to the shock of people looking at him. In his suffering, he would sprinkle or cleanse many nations. And because he succeeds in this priestly ministry of sprinkling, in spite of his suffering, 
the kings of the earth would be in awe of him and his accomplishments. So this is a summary of this first stanza. And the New Testament quotations, you know which uh, chapter they allude to or quote the most often of any chapter in the, in the Hebrew Bible on the Old Testament? 50, Isaiah 53. So it's very, very often it refers. And a lot of, if you talk to Jewish people today that aren't believers, they try so hard to get around this chapter. It's amazing how hard they try. They say, well, the, the, this doesn't say the Messiah died. Because if you say, this person dies in 53. So when I, when in classes, remember, Glenn, I talked about when you debate people, don't, don't make a statement where you can ask a question. If you ask Jewish people, so when did Israel ever die? If I was debating you, when did Israel ever die? When did he die? And you would say, well, they, we never died. And I asked one person that. They went on for 10 minutes. I'm thinking, thank you for doing that. Because I said, what you just said just now, that this servant in 53 is Israel? My friend, this servant in 53 dies, very clearly dies. You just said that Israel didn't die. So now I'm confused. Explain that to me. Um, mm, let me think about that. Yeah, yeah, you think about that. You think about that. Yeah, but it's, it's really critical to understand that this servant does, does die, so it can't be Israel. So my servant, he would act wisely, deal prudently. He'd be exalted. So look at behold. Little word, focus on that. This is really important. What God has to say here is really critical. So focus your attention on this. Now you see these phrases in Isaiah 6. Remember Isaiah 6? In the, in the year that King Uzziah died? Yes. And he was lifted up? So this is applied then to, um, then to Jesus here. So he would succeed, he would deal prudently or succeed in the sense that he would do what God wanted him to do, that he would be successful in that. And then verse 14, just as many were astonished at you, so his visage was marred more than any man and his form more than the sons of men. Well, what's that about? So many would be horrified or astonished at the sight of him. And it says he was so disfigured or marred more than any other man. So this is, I think this is the middle part is a parenthetical comment. Because it explains, so look at the first part of the verse. Why were, many, why were many astonished at him? Why were many horrified at him? Look at the middle part. That, the middle part. They were astonished because... No one expected that the rescuer would suffer and die. And that just shows how horrible suffering he went through for each of you. What does that do to your heart? To know that Jesus loved you so much that he went through horrible suffering for every single one of you. That's why they were astonished or we could translate horrified at the sight of him. So we know that when Jesus was questioned before Annas, he was slapped by an officer at the hearing before Caiaphas, he was spat upon, slapped, and beaten on the head with fists, and then they scourged him. And now the scourging would have been horrible. We have a couple of young people here. I won't get into too much detail, but the cat of nine tails, really horrible. Horrible, horrible suffering. And the mo let's say that the movies you've seen that are hard to watch, way worse. I mean, way worse than that. that, 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 that a movie can't show really the suffering he went through. He did that because he loves all of us. So that's really astonishing that he loved each of you, and that's why, that's why his visage was marred or was so disfigured. Really, he didn't look like a man anymore because he was, he was beaten so much. And then verse 15, so shall he sprinkle many nations Kings will shut their mouths at him. For what had not been told them, they shall see. And what they had not heard, they shall consider. Now, one author said it's almost as if Isaiah wrote this as he was at the foot of the cross, just kind of watching uh, what was going on. So he would sprinkle many nations, and it's through his disfiguring death that he would accomplish his work. What was his work? What was his main work? Yeah, redemption to save us through faith, that he would sprinkle many nations. Now, a priest, if you read Leviticus, 
chapters in Leviticus, they would sprinkle with blood of atonement, the water of sanctification, and, uh, and they would sprinkle with blood, water, and oil. Did not take away sins. It did make the recipient ceremonial clean and accepted before God. So he would do the ultimate sprinkling of the nations. Praise the Lord. Now, 53, now we have the second stanza. Now, remember we said the first stanza and the last one. Remember, there's five stanzas. The first and last is really God, God the Father talking about Jesus. That's why in verse 13, we saw my, all capitalized. The translators capitalize it. And then we have the last three verses of 53. We have it coming back to the Lord. It, what's interesting is he's exalted. And then he goes through a lot of horrible suffering. And then guess what happens at the end? Remember, suffering's first, and then glory is to follow. So the last three verses, he's exalted again, which we see. He suffered, he rose again, and then he ascended. And now he's at the right hand of the Father. Because Satan, do you know that Satan is accusing us all the time? You're blood bought. If you have faith, all of you have faith in Jesus, you're blood bought. And Jesus is interceding for, for us all the time that we, we have that. So now 53, 1 to 3, it changes quite a bit here. So this is now Israel's confession. Now, before we had God, God speaking, the first and last stand, this is stanza 2. We have Israel's confession regarding her rejection of the servant. Now, we have some things going on here. We have... We have what the people, it's like a contrast. We have what do the people think about Jesus that aren't believers? They looked at him and thought, he's a blasphemer, he's so, but what was the reality? We know who he was. Who he was, he's king of kings, lord of lords, the one with one word created the universe. So this is contrast between what the people thought he was and who he truly was. And then this disfigurement that he would go through, and he seemed very weak. Why? We'll see later on, like a lamb led to slaughter. He did not open his mouth. So he seems really weak. Was he weak? Hardly. This is the one who, with one word, could have killed all the soldiers with one word. He didn't need angels. But so who would, who would believe that God would save the world through a humble, suffering servant? Who would, who would plan that out rather than a glorious king? That whole idea is contrary to human pride, worldly thinking. But God, doesn't God do things quite often that doesn't meet my, you know, puny expectations? He doesn't do things the way we, the way we do things. So t- two events in the, the previous chapter, this suffering he went through uh, would, would shock us and people. And then verse 1 He says, who has believed our report? Isn't it sad that many people do not believe this? You talk to Jewish people today, and I've I've been doing this since the 80s. I used to live in Israel. I lived in Jerusalem in the 80s. I met my wife there. I didn't know when I got my first master's degree that part of that time would be meeting a a 19-year-old from New Jersey who we'd we'd fall in love and on our first date. You don't don't want to hear about that, so we'll get back to the text. but, But that was in Israel. But if, and that, that, the whole point is that I, my 30-some years doing this, 35 years of talking to Jewish people, most of them, and it makes me want to cry, they sadly reject it. God, God uses us and uses you. You do your best, and then a lot of people reject it. What can you do? That's, you, you keep praying for them. So who has believed our report? It's a rhetorical question. And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? So that now the speaker here changes from God. We talked about that, the first stanza, God speaking. Now it's Israel speaking it here. And the nation continues speaking through verse 9. So now that Israel speaks in the perspective of finally, they, he finally understand who Jesus is after rejecting him. And I think in Zechariah 12, that's another message, but Zechariah 12, we have Jesus coming back. And they will look upon me, whom they pierced. And if you look at the text, it's Yahweh speaking. How can Yahweh be pierced? That's a great question, right, for Jewish people? How can Yahweh be pierced? Zechariah 12. They will look upon me, whom they pierced. Verse 1, he's the one that stretches out the heavens and, and creates uh, humans. 
he can be pierced if he becomes a man, right? If God becomes a man, and then it says they'll look upon him, and then they mourn. Why do they mourn? They mourn in Zechariah 12. They mourn. Probably the second coming. They finally realize who he is, and it causes them to mourn, and they have bitter weeping, and they're weeping so, so terribly that husbands and wives are weeping by themselves, like, like, like for a firstborn. And you talk to Jewish people and say, well, that doesn't mean the person died. Really? <laughs> really? Remember we talked about questions? Question for you then. Why would you mourn like you lost the firstborn, like, you, like, like when Josiah died? Why would you mourn? Someone just got stabbed and you, you go to the ER? Does that make sense, anybody here? It doesn't make any sense. So you ask questions. So this is penitent Israel finally recognizing who Jesus is and that causes them. And they give three reasons here. So in the verses 1 to 3, penitent Israel gives three reasons for failing. Why did they fail to recognize? Why did people in the first century, most of them, fail to recognize who Jesus was? Well, we, we talked about it. Also, by the way, look at this phrase, arm of the Lord. Do you ever see his finger? What does God do with his fingers? When he made, yeah, when he made the universe, Psalm 83, guess what he used? Psalm 83, his fingers. When he delivered Israel from Egypt, it was by his, this is Warren Wearsby that says it, by his strong hand. But to save lost sinners, he had to bear his mighty arm. Isn't that interesting? So that's used in a couple places here. Now, verse 2. Now, we're going to talk about some reasons why did Israel reject the Messiah. And, and then they finally recognize what they've done. So let's read this. For he shall grow up before him, see the him capitalizing for God the Father, as a tender plant and as a root out of dry ground. He has no form or comeliness. And when we see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. So you sprout up like a tender plant, like a twig, and like a root out of dry, parched ground. That which shows his insignificance, no stately form or majesty. So instead of appearing as an oak, wouldn't you do that if you were planting it? You'd appear like an oak? We had an oak in our front yard in Washington, Iowa. It's huge. It might still be there. My sister, I think, is listening. Hi to my family in Arizona. Uh, it's probably still there. But wouldn't you appear as a huge oak tree? Would you pierce a little twig that you just kind of pull up? No, probably not. Because these little, these little twigs, usually that's like an unwanted shoot that just sprouts out of a root. You just, they, they take moisture from the bigger plant, so you just kind of pull it up. But reason number one why people fail to recognize that Yeshua, Jesus, was the Messiah, he was too plain to be the Messiah. So all the movies you've seen, the Jesus movies, what does Jesus look like? Handsome. Yeah. I think they ought to make him look like me, just a normal-looking guy, not, not someone who's like this cover. I, have you seen me on the cover of any major magazines? No. Because how, do, how does Hollywood judge somebody, whether they should be on the magazine? This Hollywood secular mentality, you know, money and looks. God doesn't do things that way. He does not do things that. So he was too plain to be the Messiah. It was, it was hard for Israel to believe in the servant. Who has believed, who has believed our message in verse 1? Why? It's not what they thought. It's not what they anticipated. They didn't meet their, they were talking about expectations. It didn't meet their expectations of what a deliverer uh, would look like. So this shows us is insignificant. He just appeared unimpressive. He appeared ordinary. No one would be, like, naturally attracted to him. And they were ashamed of him. Because what is man, what is, we talked about these magazines, what do they raise up as important? How about wealth? Social prestige? Reputation? Yeah, well, you're being served by others. Pampering yourself, all these different things. But that's not, and that's why he's rejected today. Now, verse 2 is really a sequel to verse 1. Looks back to the past. It describes how the arm of the Lord was revealed in him from the very beginning. And it, we talked about the expression out of dry ground a little bit. That just shows the external circumstances that uh, Jesus was born in, the birth and growth of the servant. Did he, was he born to really a wealthy background, wealthy family? It's not the way you would expect, right? 
Verse 3, some more reasons why they rejected him. Let's look at this. He, was dis he is despised and rejected by man, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. We hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised and we did not esteem him. So he experienced pain. So verse 3 develops a thought of verse 2. The onlookers go from failure to desire him. What do we have here? So verse 2 was they just didn't, they weren't attracted to him because it wasn't what they expected. How about here? Has it gotten worse? What do you think? Despised. Wow. And rejected by men. So now we've, it's gotten worse. And they won't even look at it. Almost like he has a disease. Almost like someone has leprosy or some disgusting skin disease and you won't look at him, uh, which is very sad because they're, they're looking at the king of kings, the Lord of lords who created that person. The person that, re the people that were spitting on him, you, you realize from the Bible that all of the creation is being held together by Jesus, including the spittle, including the, the wood that goes, all that. It's amazing to really to think about. So no person in the history of the, of the Jews, Baron said, David Baron, has provoked such deep-seated abhorrence. So sad, isn't it? And this is the king of kings and lord of lords. And it's mainly religious people that rejected him. That was uh, some of the people did follow him, but the religious leaders, uh, they did uh, a lot of rejection of him. And then we have the second. So now we did the first stanza. It's talking about from God the Father's standpoint. We talked about the fifth stanza is going to go back to the Father's standpoint. And we talked about this, some reasons why the people rejected him. It's not what they thought, and they despised him. Now we're looking at the third stanza. This is the middle one. So a five, isn't, the, isn't three the middle one? This is really critical. It talks about how do we get our sins forgiven when we believe in Jesus? Isn't that a great exchange? Do you like that exchange? That, that we, we place our faith in him, and what does he, and he gives us eternal life. What, do we, what does he take from us? Our sin. Our sin. So he place our sin. So this, these, this middle stanza, really critical. So this is four through six. Israel's realization about the servant's substitution or atonement. Fancy words, but he died in your place. He died in my place. Remember that day of atonement? Leviticus 16, you've read about that. They, they, they put the hand on the, on the animal, and in your sin goes to that animal. And that's, that's a substitution atonement. So he paid the penalty for our sins by dying in our place as our substitute. So he was punished uh, terribly for our sins. So let's compare our experience and his experience in this passage. Grief, what did he, what did he do? more. Sorrows, he carried our sorrows. And, and this should do something to your heart. He's your groom. You're the bride. We talked about he's coming back. Do you realize that your marriage isn't consummated yet? If I had time, I, that's another message to Calvary Chapel, the seven steps of a Jewish marriage. Our marriage isn't consummated yet. You should be looking out the window at Jesus coming. Is he going to come back? A bride is so excited about getting together with her future husband. He's our, he's our groom. So this should do something to our hearts as you just think about what he did for all of you. So our transgression, he was pierced through. For our iniquities, he was crushed. For our iniquities, he was pierced through for our transgression. The peace, chastening, brought us peace. And then by the scourging, we have healing. Is there healing in the atonement? Well, when, when are we going to be ultimately healed? You know, God does heal by his choice sometimes through faith. But when, when are we all going to be healed of all the physical glorification? When does that happen? Do you know you're not saved completely yet? You were saved in the past. You're being saved right now, the sanctification process, Romans 6 to 8. But eventually at the rapture, I call it the ultimate extreme makeover. My, my girls used to say, Dad, you could use a makeover. I said, thank you for that. You know, it doesn't really bother me. They could, yeah, you have some blemishes, and thank you, honey. Yeah, thank you for saying that. But we're talking about the ultimate extreme makeover. That's when you get a new body, and that's what we're looking forward to. So there, that's when we'll be ultimately be healed. Of, um, and God does 
does choose to heal uh, sometimes by his, uh, just by uh, his, uh, his will. And so let's keep going. So verse four, let's read this. So surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken. Isn't that sad? He did that for them, but we esteemed him stricken. This is the Jewish people speaking. Smitten by God and afflicted. So these are Jewish people that finally figured out, oh, he's the Messiah. He, he's not someone who has this, this, this bad disease that they won't even be around him. Now they're kind of figuring it out. So he lifted or bore our griefs. He carried that pain. And then he's a holy God. Sin is against a holy God. So he had to take our sin upon him. It says, uh, we esteem him stricken. The idea of that is someone who's afflicted with the hateful, shocking disease. Is that, was that the truth? See that contrast that we're talking about? What's the reality of who he was? We know the reality. How did they see him compared to the reality? See that, that back and forth we see in, in the text? Smitten by God and afflicted. Was he smitten by God? Remember the book of Job? When Job was going through all this suffering, what, 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 was, what did the friends say? They were really good counselors until they, until they opened their mouth, right? When they just sat there and, and were... I, I did a funeral on Friday, and I said, I like to do funerals more than weddings. It's not that I don't enjoy weddings, but I really love ministering to people who are really hurting. Just to sit with them and cry with them and pray with them and help them through this situation. Uh, so Job's friends, what did they say to Job? Here's, here's what... What's their, their counseling made up of? Yeah, you did something wrong. Well, what is it? Well, not sure, but it must have been something that you did wrong. So that's the way they, they looked at it. And it was a very, how about John 9? Who sinned, this man or his parents, that he should be born blind? It's his mentality. Verse 5, but he, now look at, the, look at this uh, once I, I uh, highlighted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities, the chastisement for our peace was put was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. See that back and forth? So he went there to do that for us. Uh, isn't it ironic that the wounds that the soldiers inflicted on him and the scourging, the cat of nine tails, which was pieces of bone and metal, when, so when they whipped him, it would have taken off flesh with him, and you could have seen his internal organs. Enough said. That just gives me an idea of what he went through. See what I mean? I don't mean that to shock anybody, but that's really, really what happened. If you study it and you, you read accounts of doctors talking about that, and I don't mean that to gross anybody out, but what it should do is cause you to fall even more in love with Jesus because of what he did. That's what it should lead to. So these wounds that the soldiers inflicted upon him, that was the means of healing spiritual wounds. Did they realize that? They didn't realize that, but that was the, that was the truth. So he went through a very violent death. Look, look at the phrase. He was wounded, bruised, really, really powerful. And you could translate that also crushed. He was crushed for our iniquities. So he was pierced, wounded, and crushed. And he did that for all of us. So he definitely died. So he talked to Jewish people and they say, well, he didn't die. Makes no sense. Because later on, I asked him a question, well, would you want to be buried if he didn't die? Oh, no, they get, that gives them like creep, the creep. I, I agree, that gives me the creeps. But he's buried. We're going to see he's buried. So explain to me how he can be buried and not die. That doesn't. And it said he was cut off in the land of living. I'm not all that smart, but I'm smart to think that's that sounds like death to me, right? If I say, Glenn, you were cut off from land of living, what, what does everybody think? You don't have to be a Hebrew scholar. I teach Hebrew. You don't have to be a Hebrew scholar to know, yeah, that's death. Yeah, I agree. So verse six, all 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 we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Now sheep aren't all that bright. They just follow the leader, and their, their focus is on, what do you think their focus is on? Food. It's on food. So they just follow the, down the cliff that they, so they're not too smart, so they go off in the wrong direction, have gone astray. But each of us has strayed off his own path, 
And before you make fun of sheep, I'm not that smart either. So I, I go on the wrong path as well. And Lord forgives me and brothers help me. And, and we're all sinners, but we're saved by grace. And so the servant really shouldered the consequence of sin. And it says that we've turned on his own way. But the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Wow, that's powerful. So we're glad that he did that. And the Hebrew really says the Lord caused the sin of all of us to attack him. Interesting. Now let's keep going. Now we have the, the fourth stanza. So th it, this is Israel's account about the servant's death. The servant died willingly and for others' transgressions, even though he was righteous. So we talk to a Jewish person again. They say he didn't die. Makes no sense. You're going to see some verses here that are very powerful that, yeah, he definitely did die. So verse 7, he was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before its shears is silent, so he opened not his mouth. So this verse says he was too passive to be innocent. So he was silent, he was silent at his trial. He just accepted what he was going through. He didn't proclaim his innocence. And his trial was, uh, we're going to see in the next verse what the trial is like. Because he understood that he was fulfilling God's purpose for him. It was to save sinners. He was glad, he was very glad to, uh, to do that. Verse 8, let's look about this trial here. It says, he was taken from prison and from judgment. And who will declare it his generation? For he was cut off from the land of the living. Looked like he died, right? <laughs> it's pretty clear. For the transgression of my people, he was stricken. So there's uh, from prison and from judgment. The idea there is he had an unjust trial. You agree from reading the Gospels? Unjust trial. It was a coercive legal decision. It was a very corrupt legal procedure. No legal protection, no proper defense. So that's the idea here. So his con who will declare his generation? Though well, people didn't even care. Few, few were really concerned about what he went through. But he was cut off and lay on the living. So he died in, in midstream, his, his life, die in midlife. And uh, so as a result, his contemporaries, his generation, considered that he brought this death upon himself. Was that the case? No, he accepted it willingly. They didn't understand really the real reason for his death. What was the real reason for his death? Yeah, to bear the punishment for the transgression of Israel and for us as well. In verse 9, and they made his grave with the wicked. Now you better hope you're dead if you're making your grave with the wicked. I think the idea of this could be they intended to bury him with the wicked. But with the rich at his death, because he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. So he was condemned as a criminal. He was buried in an, inex an expensive garden tomb. You know, Joseph of Arimathea, you read about, he was waiting for the kingdom to come. And they, they assigned his death with wicked men, but then they, but he was had, with the rich in his death. So and he did that for all of you, for all of us. Now the last stanza. So who's speaking here, Remember? Giving you a little pop quiz. Yeah, this is the Lord now speaking. So the Lord's promise about the blessing of the servant. So he, the servant would be exalted. Now, remember at the beginning, he's exalted? Because he'll be exalted because of his humiliation. So this is like an epilogue to this five, fifth stanza, five stanzas. So now he's speaking again. In verse 10, he says, he did please the Lord. It doesn't mean that he was happy to do that. It doesn't mean he was happy. That was the Lord's will to do this, to accomplish salvation for all of us. He has put him to grief. When you make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed. How do you see your seed if you die? How does that work? Ask a Jewish person that. Remember the questions? How do you see your seed? I thought he died. Buried. Very clearly died. How do you see your seed? Through the... We're going to celebrate April 2nd or whatever. I don't have my calendar here. Easter. Resurrection. Through the resurrection, that's how he prolongs his days. 
and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. So he would do the resurrection. So he'd have followers, and he would have life, not death. And this servant's restoration would include God's pleasure. And he would see his descendants through the resurrection. Wow, that's something, isn't it? In the verse 11, he shall see the labor of his soul and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant shall justify many, and for he shall bear their iniquities. So I think the idea here is that that's this his by his knowledge, that's a little bit ambiguous. It, means, it could mean a couple different things. I think it means that people would come to know the servant. Amen. They would. It's not. It's not the the knowledge the servant has. It's a knowledge of him like faith in him. So as a, as a result, through faith in him and having knowledge of him, what would he do for, what does he do for us? Paul develops this in Romans chapter three and other places. What does he do for us? Through knowledge, faith in him? Justified. Yeah, he, he provides justification. There's a play on words. Righteous and, and justify both have the same root word. So the righteous one, the righteous one, would declare righteous or justify those who know him. Isn't that cool? The righteous one would declare righteous those people that have knowledge or faith in him. Interesting. And this is what brings a servant, what, what, what brings a servant satisfaction? Knowing here that his suffering brought forgiveness to people. And then 12, look at all the things that are done for him. Divide him a portion with the great. Divide the spoil with the strong. He pour, because he did what? How many things did he do? He poured out his soul into death, number one. Number with the transgressors, number two. He bore the sin of many, and he made intercession for the transgressors. He's still doing that for us. Amen. So all these prophecies fulfilled here in this, in this passage. He suffered an appalling, disfiguring death. His blood, just to review, his blood sprinkled nations, brought kings to submission. He was rejected by Israel for being too plain. Remember? Expectations. He suffered and died without resistance. He just accepted God's will for him to die. He was buried in a rich man's tomb. That's a prophecy. He was resurrected from the dead. Remember, he would see, prolong his days. And he was given innumerable followers, the spiritual seed in verse 10. And he's satisfied today with the forgiveness his death provided, verse 11. And then 12, he'd be rewarded by God the Father, just like you, you win in the military and you get, you get the spoils. So if you're not a believer, and the people listening, that before we do that, before I share the gospel applications, this is a terrific witnessing tool. And... I'm hoping and praying you fall more deeply in love with Jesus through reading this. And remember, suffering is followed by, suffering is now. Keep focusing on what's coming, what's coming. Heaven, the new Jerusalem, you're on, you're on your horse. What are you going to name your horse? You can think about that. And you're following Jesus, the second coming on, on horses. That's incredible. So that's going to follow later on. Now, if anyone here is not a believer or someone listening Please listen carefully. The bad news first, man is a sinner in need of a savior. I got to start with the bad news. That's the personal predicament. But there is good news that God has provided salvation or redemption through his son, Jesus. He's fully God, fully man, and he paid the penalty, which is death, by dying on the cross and removing the barrier caused by our sin through his death and resurrection. That's a provision. And then the, what's in me? How do, you, how do you receive that? So if you're sharing, someone say, what's faith? Well, if I, if I told you, okay, the bad news is this. The good news is, who's Christ? God and man. What did he do? Died and rose again. Last question, have I convinced you? Like we're talking to Glenn. Have I convinced, yes or no? Have I convinced you? If you say yes, then do you want to receive eternal life? Yes. Hold out your hand, metaphorically. Welcome to the family. That's it? Yeah. That's, now, now that you're a believer, it involves some other thing, taking up your cross. Uh, but that's not part of salvation. Salvation is faith alone. And then it's knowing who Jesus is and what he did on the cross. It's faith in a person 
combined with faith and what he offers. What does he offer? Salve, eternal life, salvation. So that's how, that's how we receive salvation. So I encourage you to share that with people. Uh, let's pray. And I'll be here later on to uh, answer questions, including any, any, if you want to study more Messianic prophecy, there's a wonderful handbook, Moody Handbook, on Messianic prophecy. It's only those who like to dig deep. You hear me? Who like to dig deep. It's 1,400 pages. M M Michael Rodelnik is the head of the Jewish studies. He's a friend. Dr. Michael Rodelnik is a terrific speaker at Moody Bible where my grandfather went in 1920s. My grandfather was with the Lord, with, back when Al Capone was running the streets and all that stuff, and the Prohibition and Jazz era. So that's Moody Bible, and they have a wonderful, the best book I know of anywhere on the planet where you can study Messianic prophecy in more detail. And the Moody Bible commentary, the best commentary I've seen for, for Messianic prophecy, because of Mike Rodelnik was the editor of it, and again, at Moody. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for every single person here. Lord, we love you very much, and we thank you for salvation through faith. We thank you for this incredible chapter that we can, we can uh, think about and meditate on, and we can just think about your soon return, and you love us so much that this person who died for us and suffered for us is coming back as our groom, and we're the bride, so we should be uh, metaphorically, kind of looking out the window and waiting for that trumpet blast and that shout, and we'll be with you forever. So remind us of this often, that suffering is first, but we don't need to worry about suffering. Help us all to focus on things above, not on things below. Your grace is always sufficient for what we need to go through, and we can rely on you to, uh, we know that good things come from suffering. It's not easy to think about, maybe, the possibility, but uh, help us to dwell on that, and we wouldn't focus on what things that we can see. Those things are very temporary and transitory, but we would focus on what we can't see. In Yeshua's name, we all said together, amen. amen.